tonight. I'm honored to be in the house. Thank you, Pastor Anthony, co-pastor Shelley, and uh, all of the worship team and, and the, the arts that are in this place, the, the gifts that are in this place are magnificent. And I just want to say, before everybody sits down, uh, what an honor and a privilege it is. There, Pastor was saying that there was something happening in the spirit, and I believe there's something happening in the spirit, right, Ms. Rachel? Amen. There's something shifting in this community. There's some strongholds breaking in this community. Come on. Hey, come on. We're going to see more. There is more glory coming. Come on, Jesus. You are welcome in this place. Hallelujah. Demons are trembling. The kingdoms of darkness are crumbling. Come on. Men and women of God have seen the goodness of God. And we want more. We want more of you, God. Hallelujah. The hospitality and the honor in this house is impeccable. I just, I want to honor you. You know, God is attracted to honor. He's attracted to honor. There's honor and attraction in this house. And the Lord is attracted to your ministry. I want to tell you that. I feel that strongly in my spirit. The Lord is attracted to your ministry. And he's attracted to your pastor and co yeah. Praise God. So I just want to tell you guys that I am humbled to be here. I'm so thankful for both of you. I don't take this lightly to stand in this place of anointing that not only Pastor and Pastor have shared in sharing the Word of God, but that you, men and women of God, sons and daughters that are here today, many of you have shared either an announcement, a word of encouragement, but when you stand in the place that God has called you to, don't you know that there's power? There's power. It's because Jesus went before us. And so I thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here. You guys can go ahead and, and sit down. I'm, I'm going to jump into the word here in a minute. And um, I want to start by saying thank you and, and again, happy 8th year anniversary, Word of God International. Come on. Get it up for yourself. Eight years. Eight years. Hey, look, you know, you know when, you, when you're just beginning, thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. When you, when you first begin uh, ministry, at least for me, I didn't know if it was going to work. All we had was faith. All we had was faith in the beginning, right? And then you start to see some things come together and you're like, I thought I believed in the beginning, but now I really believe because I can see. But don't you know that it's better to have faith when you don't see, right? Than when you do see, because then you're trusting in the Lord Almighty. And so that's what got you to this place, is faith. We still operate by faith, not by sight. And God honors that. I just want to say to you, Pastor Anthony and Co-Pastor Shelley, take a minute. I, I had this in my notes because I thought this was important. I want you to take a minute and look around and just see what the Lord has done. Look at what the Lord has done. Look at this beautiful world. Look at these sons and daughters. I, hallelujah. Amen. Hey, I know that John said that there's no greater joy than to see your children walking in the truth. There's no greater joy than to see your children walking in the truth. I've met many of your children that are serving in the ministry, natural offspring, and their supernatural offspring, sons and daughters in this house that are, that are eating from the table that you're at. And so I'm just asking for more. I'm asking for more on your life, more prosperity, more favor, more anointing, more peace, more confidence, more boldness, more Holy Spirit, more Holy Spirit. On the Word of God International family here, we honor you as shepherds over this house. We honor the elders in this house. We honor deacons and servants. We honor those who clean the bathroom. Who's thankful for those that clean the bathroom? There is a clean bathroom in the back. Praise God for clean bathrooms. Hey, the body of Christ is strong here. When we came in, 
uh, my wife and my two children there, um, we, we were on, and honestly, I feel at home. I feel like I belong in this place. And so well done. Well done. I want to tell you guys, well done. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I am excited to be here. I am trying to calm down. Humble me, though. Humble. I'm humbled to be on what I believe is holy ground. I am so humbled to stand in this place for a time such as this. And I believe the Lord has put a word on my heart that I want to share with you. And when, I, when I'm asked to speak in another family's house where there's a different leadership that's in our house, uh, I always ask God, I prayerfully ask God to give me a word before I jump into his word, which I believe is for you guys in this season of life. Just a word of encouragement. Is it okay if I share it with you guys? Okay. Amen. Praise God. Word of God International. He has seen your hard work and faithfulness. He has seen your tears, your struggles, and your setbacks. Yet you maintain an attitude of victory with a posture of humility and meekness. Your strength and potential will increase as you abide in Him and make His presence your number one priority. this ministry. That favor has become a pipeline of stability that will empower others to continue building his kingdom in the days, months, and years ahead for generations to come. So I want to encourage you, Word of God International Ministries, to keep up the good work. Don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Praise God. Praise God. Give yourself a round of applause for abiding in the Father's love. In the grace of God. Walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on. Yes. Because you know, He doesn't violate our free will. You guys have a part to play in this. We get to participate. Come on. I love that. So I want to talk to you guys today about generational impact. Generational impact. And I've got an unusual passage of scripture. It's actually the second commandment that was given to the nation of Israel. And I'll try to unpack what I believe is some misconceptions. And then I want to share with you why I think understanding a certain perspective is going to be valuable for you guys in the days ahead. So if you would turn in Deuteronomy chapter number 5. And I'm going to be reading in a moment verses 8, 9, and 10 of the New King James Version. Before that, I want to pray. If you would, if you would, as you as you uh, find that in your Bible, just prepare your hearts. For, as, actually, as you would, stand up so we can honor honor His Word. Holy Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I come to you today with fear and trembling, Lord. As I read Your Word, I come to you today also with. With excitement and expectation because you're a God who still moves mountains. Yeah. You're a God who still heals the sick. Yeah. Gives recovery of sight to the blind and frees those who are in captivity. God, you still raise the dead today. Yeah. It's through your son Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit that you came to seek and save the lost. Not those who have it together, but those who can't get it together. And Father, I just ask. That the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may be acceptable in, in your sight, O oh Lord. For you are my Redeemer and my God. We do this all for your glory and for your name. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. For your glory, Jesus. For your glory. You may, you may sit. Today in sharing this passage, I hope to bring insight and encouragement to this house for generations to come. So I said this is an unusual passage. This is the second commandment that was given to the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, it says, God says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Thank you for your word, Lord. I want to talk to you today about the generational impact. And I know that this passage of Scripture may seem unusual. I've wrestled with it before coming here because... You know, if, if you've been raised in religion, this could sound condemning. This could sound really condemning, but it's not condemning at all. It's actually life-giving wisdom. And so I want to share with you today uh, some ways that people may understand this. And then I'm going to share with you a new perspective because I believe it's going to help you in the days and the years and for generations to come. So a common misunderstanding regarding this word is that, is that, uh, in verse 9, when, when God says that the iniquity of the fathers will be will be put off onto the children to the third and fourth generation, that doesn't mean that we will stand in judgment for what our parents did. And if you read through your Bible, you'll see passages like in Ezekiel that says, well, we all stand and give an account for our sins. But you, are you thankful that Jesus stood in our place? sin for us, that he was in fact crucified, and if we put our faith in Jesus, we were co-crucified, and co-resurrected, and co-ascended to the right hand of the Father, and we're now seated with him in high places? Come on, that is a good, encouraging word for somebody who's struggling with condemnation. So, so why am I sharing this passage of scripture? Because I think there's something going on underneath the surface, because we hear that. We hear that good, glorious news of God's grace, but we don't understand the systems that are going on underneath a lot of our lifestyles, a lot of things that we were grown up and, and, and informed about, right, or uninformed about. And so I want to talk about the impact and the implications that understanding what God is saying here can have on not only this house, but my house and houses down the road and every church that is in this community. If we understand this, I believe it will be the first step in starting to really get true freedom. And so that's what we want, right? Amen? Praise God. We want true freedom. We want liberty because wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. And I believe the Spirit of the Lord is breathing on this family. As many of you know, the book of Deuteronomy is an Old Testament book. It's one of the first five books, uh, some call it the Torah. Uh, the, the, the law and, and so that word Deuteronomy actually means copy or repetition it could mean a second law and that's because Moses was actually retelling the story of his journey through the, uh, through, the, through the wilderness when he went to rescue the Israelites from the Egyptian bondage they were in and so as he was retelling the story God, God, was, God was using him to talk about how he, he was going to send, right, the Savior to rescue us from bondage and captivity. And he was calling the nation of Israel God's special possession. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but even before you came out of darkness and into the kingdom of his dearly love, you were the apple of God's eye. Right? You were the apple of God's eye. Come on. You were God's special possession before you even knew it. That's why he came in the form of a man and died on the cross and bled for you see, because he wants you to know how much he loves you. The Bible says that God is love and that nothing in all of creation, no demon in hell can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Moses was a man like us. He didn't want to go. Matter of fact, he tried to take justice into his own hands before he found himself standing before a, born, a, a burning bush. And God is reestablishing him to his assignment in a foreign land. Right? He's finding himself running away like many of us do. Many of us, maybe this is a word for somebody. You, you ran away from your assignment because you tried to take justice into your own hands. It didn't work. And you're now finding yourself in a dark place. But I'm telling you that the glory of God can show up in a crack house, at a bar, at a gambling table. He can show up anywhere you want. There is nothing. Darkness doesn't come from the in the light of God. Come on. His light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. 
Moses ran away. But God. But hey, God. you ever have one of those but God moments? But God. Hey, but God. The devil thought he had you, but Jesus said he's mine. He's mine. The devil thought he had us, but Jesus said he is mine. She is mine. You are mine. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything is Jesus. I heard a woman preach this morning and she said, the devil, a lot of people think the devil wants to destroy the church, but that's impossible. But what he tries to do is control the church. That's the only thing that he can do through deception and manipulation and insecurity. And I want to tell you, I want you to be confident that you don't have to do another thing to, to, to make God love you. He just loves you. He just loves you. I know it's so hard to get through our heads, but you don't have to jump through a bunch of religious hoops to get God to love you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. If you don't hear anything else I have to say today, God loves you. God loves Word of God International. God loves you, Pastor. Go, Pastor. He loves all of you online and in this house. I'm always encouraged by this passage of Scripture in Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Hey, I'm glad to read through the Gospels, Pastor, and, and, and see the disciples that he picked to follow him. They were fishermen. They were prostitutes. They were tax collectors. And it said they left everything they had to support them to follow the one thing that mattered. And, and, and eventually on the day of Pentecost, which we just celebrated, right, the Spirit came down. They got filled with boldness. And the Bible says that they were the ones that were known as those who had been with Jesus and those who would turn the world upside down. I want to tell you that God is using you to turn this community upside down in Jesus' name. Mighty God, I pray. Come on, I wish somebody would hear me. I wish somebody would believe me today that God is using you to upset the kingdoms of darkness. Come on. I wish somebody would hear me today. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. I wish somebody would praise God right now. Come on. Oh, Jesus. God of all glory and honor and majesty to the Lamb of God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Are you thankful that He still rescues people from darkness? Are you thankful that it not only calls us His special possession, but a holy nation, a royal priesthood? Oh, mighty God, kings and priests is what the Bible says. We are ambassadors. We stand between heaven and earth declaring the glory of God, the riches of His kindness and His goodness for the marginalized and the overlooked. And why do we know that that's true? Because I was one of them. And he came into that jail cell and he said, I want that one. And I've been trying to get over it my whole life. I'm finally starting to believe it. That I'm somebody. Not because I think I'm somebody, but because he said I'm somebody. Come on. Woo. Hallelujah. You know, Moses, in this passage of scripture, later on in verse... 22 of Deuteronomy, he said that God spoke to the entire nation of Israel. For a long time I thought that God spoke to Moses, giving him the Ten Commandments, but he actually spoke in a loud voice from the fire of his glory from Mount Sinai to the whole nation of Israel. I, I want to tell you, Word of God International, to get ready, because when the glory of God shows up, some people some people stay still, some people run away, and some people press in. You remember when Isaiah saw the glory of God, and he fell down and said, Woe is me! And he stood back up, and the Lord touched his lips, made him holy, and God said, I want to send somebody. And he said, Here I am. Send me. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be sent right to the edge of the gates of hell and say, You are defeated, and we're taking back everything. Some of us are waiting for the Lord to come.
come back so that we can get out of this awful place. But if he doesn't come back soon, I hope that he comes back and the earth looks more like heaven than it does hell. Because there's a people, there's a remnant who want to press in to the glory of God. The mountain of joy, as Hebrews says. Woo! Hey, when his presence shows up, mountains begin to shake. Mountains begin to shake. Bushes manifest. The Bible says that rivers of living water begin to bubble up to eternal life. It says that deserts turn into seas teeming with life. This is encouraging. I don't know if you guys read your Bibles, but all you got to do is read your Bibles and you'll come out of there with a fire shut up in your bones because God is able and He's doing it. We're living in it. Shame loses its grip and perfect love drives out all fear. Demons tremble. I was talking with pastor last week and I said something's happening in our church. Demons are manifesting just at the mention of the name of Jesus. And we're casting them out. We're casting them out. You know, these guys are like, hey, that's not real. Well, it's real where we are. It's real. I don't know about you guys, but demons are trembling and the kingdoms of darkness are crumbling. Honor. Unity. In the community, right? It's happening. It's happening. We're seeing demons tremble. And so there's something happening that I just want you to know that you are right in the midst of it and God's favor is on this ministry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Moses was not only called to rescue people, but he was actually called to occupy the promised land flowing with milk and honey. He was called to push out the idolatry, everything that had been perverted to be made right. And we know that he was standing in this place retelling the story of his ministry. And we know by the end of the book, he wasn't able to go into the promised land, but he passed the baton. And I think it's important for us to know that there are people that are coming behind us that we need to train up in the Lord. Right? Because when we occupy the promised land, the Bible doesn't just say the land flowing with milk and honey. But Jesus says, disciple all nations. Disciple all nations. He wants to put an end to the catalyst of iniquity that keeps sin from ruling in the hearts of those that he calls to inherit the promise that was given to Abraham. That he would be the father of many nations. Moses stood on the eastern side of the Jordan River across from the promised land and he began quoting what the Lord had said from the fire of his glory to the people. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. I want to tell you this. Whatever we behold, we become. I'll bring you all the way back to Genesis. They beheld the beauty of the fruit. And they became death. They died and were separated from God. They hid from God, they felt shame, they blamed one another, and they covered up with a fig leaf, which I believe represents religion. Do you ever know that there was a story when Jesus was heading to the cross, there was one thing that he did that's always been unusual to me, and he passed by a fig tree, and he said there was no fruit on it. And when he came back, there was still no fruit on it. And he cursed the fig tree and said, may you never bear fruit again. I believe he was cursing the cover-ups. He was cursing the cover-ups. And he was giving us back the righteousness of the lamb in an animal skin. He was giving us back our right standing with God so that we don't feel like we need to work for love anymore. Amen. He's cursing our cover-ups. Yeah. Right? See, God, Jesus came. Not to fight against us in our sin, but to fight with us against our sin. Come on, that's what he's saying. Don't make any carved images for yourself. Hey, look, I'm here to set the captives free. So don't make anything in heaven above, on the earth below, or in the waters. Because I am here and I'm all you need. Praise God. Hallelujah. Whatever we behold, we become. That's why the Bible says, fix your eyes. On the author and perfecter of your faith. Whatever is admirable. Whatever is 
true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy. Think about these things. Whatever we behold, we will become. We are being transformed into the image of His Son from glory to glory. Now, I don't believe that we have to become something that we are already. When we accept Christ, we are fully accepted. We are born again. We are a new creation. So what is obedience about? It's about revealing what's in us. Yeah. It's about unpacking the grace of God. Yeah. It's about releasing the gifts in all of creation, right? Yeah. We are stewards over all of creation. Yeah. Yeah. And it says the whole creation itself is groaning for the revealing of the sons and daughters right, of God. Right, right, right. Oh my God. I wish we could catch, catch a revelation of what's going on in the spirit. Hallelujah. Hey, look, I want to share something with you, and I'm going to work through this. Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope that you help me, Holy Spirit. There's a term called, anybody ever heard of this term called epigenetics? Nobody's turned, hold, heard the term? Okay, all right. All right, Tony, my man. Me and Tony. Stand up for a minute, Tony. This is my man right here. Hey, I prayed for this relationship for that specific man a year and a half ago, and I believe that you were part of the answer to that prayer and that this ministry is a part of the answer to that prayer. I stood up in our church that year and a half old, and I looked across the congregation and I said, it's a bunch of flannel shirts and a bunch of white people. What happened? What happened? Whatever we behold, we become, right? And so I'm like, Lord, Lord, this isn't what heaven looks like. Well, what happens? And I remember going to a men's group, and me and, I call him Pastor Tony, he just hasn't believed it yet. Uh, but uh, anyways, anyways, we went to a men's group, and in that men's group, there was a man who said, you know, the most divided day during the week is Sunday morning. And I said, something's got to change, God. Something's got to change in me. Help me, Jesus. Help me, because I don't want it to be like this. And this is where I want to share with you something called epigenetics. So this term epigenetics, we all have DNA, we all have genes. But then this thing that scientists have found out is that there's an epigenetic to the genomes in our body, in our DNA. DNA and, and genes are like, if you have kids, they're going to look like you, they're going to talk like you, they're going to have little perks like you, uh, eye color, all those types of things. But epigenetics means that whatever your parents were traumatized by can start to capitalize on your genetic makeup. And they can be the producer of what will happen in the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. So to prove a point, I read a science experiment that they did to prove this. Epigenetics is actually, you know, happening. And they took some mice, they put them in a cage, and on the bottom of the cage they had some shocking things. And they had a hole in the cage where they were able to squirt some fruit-smelling aroma. So they put the mice in this cage and they squirted some aroma that smelled like fruit. And they shocked the mice at the same time. And of course they got shocked. So they did it a few times. They took the mice out of the cage. And then they bred the mice. And they raised these baby mice. They put them in the cage. This time they didn't put the shockers on it. And they put the aroma in the cage and the mice acted like they were being shocked to the third and fourth generation. You see, I think, I think we can get a little wisdom of what God is telling us when we, when we make idolatry about something, whether it's pain or pleasure or whatever in the past, we are epigenetically wired to be affected by that. And so we think about what our legacy is, what we've inherited from our forefathers. It's not that we'll stand in judgment, but we inherit trauma. And so it doesn't mean that we're predisposed if you were raised in an alcoholic home that you're going to run after alcohol. But once you open that door, the statistics of you chasing after the alcohol are really high. And so that's, that's what epigenetics, that's the disease of sin and death. But aren't you thankful that Jesus came to curse sin? He came to put an end to the curse of sin and the fear of death. Praise God. I told you I would share with you another perspective that I believe would help us know the implications of why this view is important. In verse 9, it says, you shall not bow down to these carved images. 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And I want to tell you that the devil hates God. He's the one that hates God. And he's the one that's trying to pervert what God has made us into, into the image of our Father in heaven. A man named Albert Tate of Fellowship Church explained that there are two types of jealousy. One is worldly jealousy and the other godly jealousy. I was schooled in this by a spiritual father of mine when I met my wife. I was like, I was like, man, she sure is jealous. When I pick up my phone, you know, when my friends call me, and he said, do you realize that that's a good thing that your wife is jealous about you? And I was like, I didn't really think about that. When it comes to worldly jealousy, you're trying to control somebody. She wasn't trying to control somebody. She just didn't want to share me with somebody. Hey, are you thankful that God doesn't want to share you with anybody else? He doesn't want to share you with the devil or sin or disease. He doesn't want to share you with that. He jealously longs for the spirit that he has placed within you. Hey, I'm thankful that God is jealous for me. Oh, my God. God's jealousy for us is righteous. It comes from his holiness and fidelity to us. Like a loyal, loving spouse, he doesn't want to share us with sin. God is jealous for us. He doesn't want anything from us. He's jealous for us to inherit the abundant life. He jealously longs for us to be strong. And to be a kind of peculiar people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. To be that special possession. He wants us to realize it. To walk in it. To the third and fourth generation. Yeah. When we turn to idols. We grieve him. Why? Because he wants so much more for us. Yeah. He doesn't want us to live below our potential. Because yeah. remember what we behold. Is what we become. He says this, not only do images misrepresent the nature of God, but they destroy the nature of man. In Psalm 115, verse 8, it says, those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. I'm here to tell you that some things that have happened to you in the past because of those who hate God have rewired God's design for our lives. And I don't know if you can read between the lines, but there are some things that have happened in the past that were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It was injustice. Yeah. Nobody should own anybody. Yeah. It's only God who owns us, right? Yeah. And so I'm not here to fix anything. I am just here to say, let's work through this thing so that we can see the glory of God covering the earth as the water covers the sea. Praise God. Hallelujah. He's doing something. I'm telling you what, he's doing something. And I want to sit at a table with you. And I want to talk about it. I want to pray about it. I want to worship. I want to ask God for wisdom. How do we move forward? How do we end the curse, God? Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Just before meeting Pastor Anthony and co-pastor Shelley, I've been praying for God to break a stronghold in our community. And then by God's providence, we met at a fundraiser. After just a couple conversations at that table, I was like, oh, Lord, he's answering the prayers. <laughs> Do you know that God answers prayers? He's faithful and he's an on-time God. We are built for a time such as this. And I want you to be encouraged in a good cheer because God is on the move. So hang on. Hang on. Hang on. The Apostle Paul says the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. And there are some things that we, that, we are, that we are rewired to think about, but it's not God's will for us. There are some things that we run to to make us feel comfortable. But I want to tell you to leave the carved images alone. And behold the one 
that you can't right. see. you got to get in the spirit, right? We only know the, the visible image of the invisible God. But he made a way and he said, it's a good thing that I go away. So that I might not just come and be with you, but I want to be in you. Yeah. Come on. I want to be in you. I want you to be my image bearer. Yeah. One thing that we're learning in our faith family is to be blown by the wind of God's spirit. Yeah. After making this discovery, you know, ministry isn't about telling people what they need to do. It's about me learning who God is and how He wants me to relate to His body. It's not about me lording over, but it's about me abiding in His perfect gifts, which are people. You guys are beautiful. You guys matter. You guys are priceless. I honor each and every one of you. I hope that you feel that way about yourself. If you don't feel that way, I'm going to keep telling you. I'm going to post it on Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. Why? Because God says so. And I agree with God. And I'm learning to love you the way that he loves me. Praise God. Hallelujah. If we're not careful, we can allow this epigenetic culture to become a robo. In Christianity causes us to become a rowboat instead of a sailboat. You see, Jesus said anyone born of the Spirit is like the wind. You don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So, so he's changing us from rowing where we want to go, making carved images of how we think church should go. And he's saying, I just want you to lift your sail and let me carry you along by the wind of my Spirit. We're learning how to be carried along by the wind of God Almighty to the destinations and the assignments that he's called us to. And so look at what the wind blew in. Look at this guy. Hey! Come on, look at what the wind blew in. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I've tried to imagine what Moses felt as he was quoting this commandment to a nation of people who have been traumatized by their past. I actually called Tony up and I said, man, I feel like this is on my heart. How do I say this to something that you understand? How do I say what I want to say uh, in a way that is palatable? He said, just be you. He said, just be you. I love you. I trust you. People want to hear these things. They don't want to be around the bush. Let's just talk about it. And so I'm here. Look at what the wind blew in. Look at what the wind blew in. We're ready to have a conversation. And I believe this eighth year anniversary is about a big conversation in the future about what God wants to do. And so I hope this is a memorial that God is shifting things in this community. And that it's going to look different until Jesus comes back to his bride. And it's going to be holy and blameless and beautified and worshiping and glorifying to God. Hallelujah. No more divisions in the body of Christ. Come on. They had these mutations and these propensities to exalt and behold things that will cause pain and result in spiritual death for generations to come. But rather, he was wanting them to focus on and behold the one who could transform them into his glorious image. It's a beautiful thing. We are like gems in his crown. We are all so beautiful. The world needs us to behold the one who created us. The Apostle Paul, again, I, probably my favorite guy to read, maybe because he wrote most of the New Testament. But he said, one thing that I do, I forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. Hey, look, I can't change what happened. But I can change what the future looks like if I behold the one who holds all things in the palm of his hands. Praise God, we're moving forward. We're going to talk about the past, but we're not going to dwell on it. We're going to, we're going to talk about it. We're going to cry over it. We're going to love each other through it. But we're going to focus on moving forward. In Jesus' name. I hope it's okay. <laughs> he said, me, you. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> You must trust me. <laughs> Word of God International, you've been called to make a generational impact. Right. And I love the but God in verse 10. Oh, yeah. But God wants to show mercy to thousands. Yeah. To those who love me and keep my commands. Yeah. 
As we close, I want to share this testimony. I shared it at the fundraiser last time that I was here. Some of you know that my mother committed suicide while I was incarcerated. It was about God gripping my heart, helping me understand the epigenetic mutations in my own life that had led me to a life of addiction. And I realized that the enemy had, had worked through all of these circumstances throughout the course of my family for, for, for generations. Right? There was, there was depression. There, there was uh, addiction. There was insecurity issues. And the Lord enlightened me to it. And when my mom passed away, I knew it was, it was a cross that the Lord showed me to wake me up. And I realized that the Lord was doing something in my generation, not to break a, a, a generational curse, because I don't like that word curse. I believe he's cursing the curse. He's not cursing us, right? He's cursing the things that keep us in bondage. He's not coming to punish us. He's coming to free us. That's what kind of God we serve, right? So we went to these survivor of suicide meetings in Portsmouth, Virginia, because that's where I grew up, Chesapeake, Portsmouth. And uh, in, these, in these meetings, we went week after week, month after month, and I could see people caught in their struggle. But I felt myself moving in, in, in the promises of God. I started to behold Jesus, and I felt myself healing. And I remember this one lady. She had lost her son to suicide, and, and, and he, somehow it had a, a, to do with a dirt bike accident. So what she did is a memorial. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to honor things, right? It's not wrong to enjoy things, but she made a carved image of this dirt bike. And she set it up in her garage, and she would go out there, and she would sit, and she would weep because she missed her son. And I understand that. But she had three other kids and a husband that lost not only their son and their brother, but they lost a mother too. You see, there was something that was triggered in her trauma, maybe from her past, where she couldn't let go. And I wanted to help her so much, but I don't know what it is. I don't know who's in this room today. But I want to tell you that the door is open. The chains are off. The prison doors have been blown open. And Jesus is saying, come, come, get out of that mess. Leave your carved images behind. Leave your pain behind and come to the pain taker. Come to the healer. Come to the great physician. I want to tell you that he wants to do for you what you can't do for yourself. He wants to show mercy to thousands, to those who love him and keep his commandments. All you got to do is believe. The Bible says if you want to get right with Jesus, if you want to come out of the darkness, you just have to believe. Holy Spirit's going to fill you and you're going to run to the altar. Right? Pastor and this family here, they will love on you. They will lay hands on you. They will cast out demons. They will stand by you. They will fellowship with you. And so I just want to, I want to give that invitation. I don't know who's here today. That, that, that this word pricked in their heart, but you've been struggling with something. And it's time to leave some stuff behind. We're not saying that you got to forget about it. But we're just saying it's time to move on. And I believe in order for Word of God, International Ministries to move forward, that everybody has to be in agreement, oh, yeah. that I'm no longer going to hold on to what held on to me, but I'm going to behold the one who created me. So if that's you, is it all right to call him up so we can, okay. So if that's you, if you would stand to your feet, we want to give that invitation for you guys to just come. And we, want, and we want to prophetically declare over your life that every stronghold, everything that's kept you in bondage, everything that has held you back from the destiny that God has preordained for you will be broken in the mighty name of Jesus.